Uh, good evening. I'm, I'm Madeline Peel, and I'm the moderator of Community Board 8 Speaks. And it's my great pleasure to be here with Marie Byrne, who is an archivist and a historian who has lived in the city and suburban uh, complex uh, over the years. And uh, we are going to take you all on a wonderful tour of living history. Uh, what it was like to live in the, this particular model community when it got started. And Marie is going to give us a short uh, version of what we're going to see. It's so exciting, Marie. Hi, I'm so glad you're here today. It's going to be a wonderful tour. <clears throat> and let me just backtrack. If we think about the Lower East Side in the early or the mid 1800s, there was an appalling housing conditions where housing lots that were 25 by 100 that were meant for a single family home were being turned into multi-dwelling buildings. And this caused one of the worst conditions uh, in the country for uh, the immigrants coming over here. In response to that, uh, a group of philanthropists, some of them from the East Side House Settlement on the Upper East Side, got together uh, in the late 1800s and developed a corporation called the City and Suburban Homes Company. Uh, these were people from the uh, Auchincloss, Rockefeller, Gould, um, Astor cutting, family, exactly. cutting. Yeah. Um, and they formed this corporation, which was benign capitalism. They had limited dividend. They were still making money. The investors were still getting a return of 5% on their investment, opposed to the 20% return on the investment well, of the Lower East Side. That's better than Sun Banks today. Yes, better than <laughs> any of my investments, that's for sure. Um, so they uh, had a contest in the uh, 1890s, and they invited architects to come and design uh, something in response to the housing conditions, a model tenement. And the winner uh, of the company, Hardy and Short, um, they designed what I call, and I'll show you, the square donut. And that is so that each room has windows, light, and air, and breezes, and a big courtyard in the middle of the building. And where you call it the alleyway, it would be a courtyard in the mm -hmm. back of the buildings. Um, Which just was a place to keep other services so that they were out of sight. Right. And the the court and children who were running yes. around <laughs> their mothers on an inside courtyard. Yes. yes. So how how fascinating. So um, the buildings started on First Avenue, which is why they're called start on York Avenue. Oh, York Avenue. I'm right. sorry. That's why they're called the York Avenue Estates. Yes. And they work their way down from 1901 through 1913, being built as demand and also as right. more people decided, hey, this was a very good investment and uh, let's build more houses. And exactly. the river, people don't realize, the river was not a fashionable place to live. In, in it was me, Marie Curie Avenue at the time, and there were uh, quarries on, up on 79th Street. There were uh, some businesses along the way, and then there were some mansions up by um, Carl Schultz Park. Yeah, Gracie Mansion, yes. as a matter of fact. One of the Still great, there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, I think you'll point out to us underneath there were, there were places where stables were too. People in the neighborhood have talked about that, right. and we'll we'll meet some of the um, the citizens of uh, Community Board Eight who actually grew up in this neighborhood, right. and we'll we'll get some interesting uh, firsthand accounts of of what it was like. So we're right. looking forward to this. And, and here we are, over a hundred years later, thanks to the Coalition to Save City and Suburban Home, including some of the original families. Um, who were part of the group that started the City and Suburban Home Company that uh, helped us to landmark these buildings and, Fantastic. and save them for future well, generations. Join us now for a, uh, a living history tour. And it's going to happen, of course, in the daylight, so you'll get a chance to see the neighborhood in all of its glory. But it's also going to be perhaps a little noisy because we're doing it on, on a regular day. Um, not on a weekend, so we're taking right. a very special tour and we're going to take you with us as well. Right. Thank you, Marie. Thank you so much, Nathan. We're in front of uh, one of the buildings on 79th Street, and this is where there are three components to the architecture in these buildings. Uh, you've mentioned to me that they started building uh, in 1901 to 1913. The corporation was set up long before that, but um, they started building with, and they had competitions for the architects, right, didn't they? Did. they? Yes. Yeah. Tell me about this building. Um, two, and it, there are how many 
buildings in the whole complex? Uh, there are, it looks like 24, but there's actually 14 buildings, including the Junior League Hotel. And that currently there are about 1,300 apartments. This design here is from Party and Short. They did the Alwyn Court on the west side and some yes, other very west famous. Yes, Street. Yeah. Yes. And 7th Avenue. Right, some very famous uh, buildings. And if you just look at the architecture, although it was done on a budget, city and suburban homes company felt that working class people, the new immigrants, should have aesthetic beauty within that budget. So you see that they're very handsomely done. The entire square block with this beautiful brickwork, which we'll never see again. Uh, the ornamentation around the building is marked up. The doors are very uh, wonderful hard, every one of them. I think those might be the original ones. The fire escapes uh, were done with great ornament. Just and so that was always an original the ornament feature, here. The, yes. uh, fire escapes, which right. is very unusual. And they, because at that time, that right. wasn't how people were thinking. Right. But, but that was because the architects in their competition right. really thought through what would a family need to have the best benefits in terms of light and air, a large kitchen where the family could gather because that's right. where the homework took place and that's where the English lessons, everybody learned yes. English right. um, and everybody cooked and manja. You know, right. this is how people lived and loved. Absolutely. And these apartments are constructed on that basis. So, right. uh, And the design, the winning of the design is what I call, I'm not an architect, the square donut. The square donut design is there's a hole in the middle of this whole square, and that's where we have the large courtyards. We will be able to see one down the block. That's why you mentioned that there are 14 buildings, but it looks like there are 24 or more. Right. Because there are two sets of stairs, so right. that everybody's got window, more windows than you could imagine, or they could imagine, since right. we saw the old law tenements. Right. Every, win every room has a window. Yes, oh, and, and less people were walking um, up the stairs because of it, so you wouldn't, even though they're five-story walk-ups, and they're, I think they're double landings, aren't they? So, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite, quite a bit of a walking, but, and, and the concept of privacy, the concept of privacy was very important because if you had, if every apartment had their own bathroom, their own toilet, there would be no sharing a bath in the hall. Now, this doesn't sound novel to us, but in those days, a hundred years ago, this was an unbelievable sanitary improvement. And right. uh, that's why these buildings show how history was made for regular people. And these became the standards, not just in New York, but for America to uphold in all the great cities. Right. And it started here in Community Board 8. Now, in the City of Burn Homes Company, there were many wonderful people. One of them was uh, Bishop uh, Potter. Was and an Episcopalian bishop, wasn't he? Yes. And, and, and what, was he on another board? He was on the Eastside Settlement House board and the City of Suburban uh, board. And when he, he stated to his friends and family, when I die, do not you know, erect a monument to me. Please put some more of your uh, investment into city and suburban and just keep it going. And that's what they did. So the rest of the complex is done in the Bones Arts architecture. This uh, buildings or group of buildings are done in the neo-Gothic. So Bishop Codman was very concerned about this, this uh, architecture staying intact. And it was designed so that everything looked up towards heaven. So you were mentioning the, the parapet. Right. What, what else so, in the architecture? Um, the parapets? All in the honor parapets. of Bishop Potter, the, um, all of the ornamentation on the building points towards heaven is that Gothic style. The archways over the door, the uh, designs on the fire escapes, and the two-tone color of the brick, which is the the usual light color and then a dark color to look more like a Gothic cathedral. Marie, I noticed that there, these courtyards are almost like alleyways between uh, the buildings. So there were the three architects. But this was a separate building altogether, and it's reinforced by having this marvelous alley. And tell us what the use of this alley was for. Well, for light and air to come into the back of the building. 
you have See, to, you have this, to. This goes all, for light and air to come in the back of the building. This goes all the way to the next block, and it forms actually a T. This is the top of the T, and then the bottom of the T goes all the way down towards the FDR Drive. And that is the back of all the buildings that we see have light and air coming in from the back, as well as from what I said, the square donut, where there's the hole in the middle, which makes a big courtyard. Well, there's more to this back alley than meets the eye. In fact, uh, Marjorie uh, and Loretta were telling us that this back alley was also, this is between the houses on 78th and 79th Street. So it runs all the way down to the river from uh, York Avenue but it was used as a place with benches where mothers did what, Marjorie? What did, mothers came out here with their children and they told them they played here and they used to have um, benches and things of that sort. As you can see how wide this is, and uh, these are the buildings that are here, they are the ones that are the inner buildings and you can see how they get their inner. And on the other side, there was a porch. Right. But this was a great place so mothers didn't have to worry about their children running into the street and being run over by, by a streetcar and then a bus. And in terms of transportation, so many changes happened. So this was a great safe place. Now, some time ago, the, the subject had come up that they want to possibly put benches here again like they used to have and maybe have flowers and so forth. Whether this will ever come to pass. But well, we're, hoping. we're hoping. We're hoping. Right. But architecture now. Fortunately, um, all buildings have these internal courtyards. What is it about this that makes it so unique? Buildings, the courtyard is not accessible from the street. That's what you see. You can see it. Uh, it shows you that there's four Sierra levels for the folks who go up and down, um, that there's light and air in the courtyard, so every apartment has windows that either face the courtyard or they face out to the street, or as I was mentioning that uh, the main courtyard is shaped like a T in the back, and uh, the windows would face there. So the main idea of doing square donut uh, type of architecture is to have light and air made to every apartment. Well, I noticed that the, uh, the landings all have very good, uh, their, their windows on the landing side and also for their bathrooms, right? So that you really get a lot of light in there, and uh, it's very pleasant in here. And I understand from um, we were talking a little bit before with Loretta and with Marjorie that um, in previous days this is where people would gather, and um, at different holiday times like Christmas, uh, there were a lot of Germans in the neighborhood and Italians and, and Irish and they would gather and, and sing Christmas carols uh, in this courtyard around the tree. So that was a tradition that happened for many years, and, and uh, you know, those were the kind of traditions that keep the community knit together. And we would fall, get into a line, we would go all around the complex, stop in various spots there, if we knew there was an older person that could not come out, somebody would sit on that on their door, we're we're at a very unusual crossroads. We happen to be at Cherokee Place, and Cherokee Place in 77th Street, which is between the East River and York Avenue is an unusual spot because it's got how many different parts of this planned community that you can see? Many, well, many of them. Uh, right behind us is the Cherokee Apartments, which started out as the Shively Sanitary Tenements. They were, were also called, we just found the out, the Vanderbilts. Vanderbilts. Uh, the Vanderbilt family had a friend, Dr. Shively, who was very interested in working with tuberculosis patients. And he came up with the idea of using a similar square donut concept for building for light and air and the apartments have three tier windows so that the windows go all the way up and the fire escapes are more like a balcony than a fire escape 
So the people, it, like today it would be more like a hospice. People uh, were, people that were most thought to be recovering from tuberculosis. Um, and then all the way down, you can see city and suburban. And then over here to my left, you see John Jay Park. And the East Side House Settlement, the Board of Directors petitioned to the New York State uh, Legislature to set aside parkland for this area so that there would be open air for children to play in and also for a bathhouse, a public yes, bathhouse. And, and I noticed that the park area is 3.312 acres, which is yes. really quite phenomenal. It is um, large and right on the river. Exactly. And most of us that grew up in this neighborhood uh, used to come down to John Jay Pool, which was the best pool in the world. Yes, I did. And, you uh, did. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was an oasis. And still people really don't know that this exists over here. It's always a challenge to, uh, when you get in a taxi to say, may I have Cherokee Place? And every once in a while they say, oh, you're trying to get me. I know exactly where it is. Yes. Well, <laughs> the other interesting thing is standing here, you pointed out to me that you can actually see the public school as well. And uh, just across the street is the Webster Library. So at this juncture, we're really able to see many, many of the components that are part of this early planned community. We're in front of the Junior League uh, Hotel. Actually, it's the former Junior League Hotel. And it was built for young working women. And they actually uh, were able to live here away from their families, which is a very unusual feature in those days. People lived at home until they got married. So this was a way for, for young women who had decided to embark uh, on careers uh, as uh, Stenographers, seamstresses, and seamstresses, teachers, and secretaries. Yeah, all yeah. things like you know, all sorts of really great basic careers, uh, and very helpful in the in the uh, post-industrial. Well, actually, it was post-industrial economy. So they got to live here, and it was basically what on a, on a weekly basis that they would rent. They their they would pay a weekly rent, although some of them lived here for quite a while. And uh, what happened was, as people were investing in the city and suburban homes company. Um, the Junior League came up with the idea of why don't we build a women's hotel exclusively for women and they built something that was a model thereafter because it was so wonderful. It had 350 rooms for women. On the main floor they had parlors, typing rooms, sewing rooms. Um, no gentleman callers were allowed above the main floor and uh, the rooms were some double rooms with, uh, or single rooms with a dresser and a desk for writing. And, and, and also they got their meals here. They got, um, for five to seven dollars a week, they got uh, two meals a day, breakfast and dinner, and on Sunday, because Saturday in those days was a work day, uh, they got three meals, uh, which was really wonderful for that price. And, and, and many of the women who started here, like they came from all over the country, all over the world, they lived here, some of them met a fella and um, moved, got married and moved up to the apartments in city and suburban. So they just moved around the corner or up the street? Up the street and had their families, raised their families there. Fantastic. Okay, and this is uh, our plaque that puts us on the National Register of Historic Places and which yeah. we're so proud of. It was a long fight, but um, campaign to landmark and preserve them, but here we are. I'm here with fellow board member, uh, Betty Cooper Wallerstein and she is a very integral part of the process here uh, regarding city and suburban, or what we call the York Estates. And uh, Betty formed um, a number of different coalitions with, with tenants and people and organizations outside the tenant group and reached out as all good community board members should. And so, um, <laughs> Betty, could you explain how you, you got involved and we'll take it from here. Well, in February of 1984, I formed the East 79th Street Block Association uh, because of transportation and development concerns, overdevelopment. Yes, and, and the then far east side. The far east side transportation, transportation was, a was a very big issue, and also, and still is, and also we were noticing very, very oversized buildings uh, causing uh, loss of air and light, something which is still a big issue. So I would say that around November of that year, 
uh, Loretta and other people from East 79th Street who were coming to the meetings told me that um, they had received letters that the building had been sold uh, or they were hearing rumors. I think the rumors were first. They were hearing rumors that the buildings had been sold, that they would be evicted. And I remember saying, how could that be? Isn't this a landmark? Because when I moved to the neighborhood, I recognized that the buildings were very old, and I had heard that they were of importance. So I said, aren't they a landmark? And so then I began to explore and called the Landmarks Commission and found out that while they were important enough to be studied, they were in a list, a group of, of buildings to be studied, they had not yet gotten to them. Uh -huh. So what I did was to collect and talk to and call and um, be joined by some 200 groups. Mm -hmm. And I saw this campaign, this fight to preserve this building as having this three or four, to have like three or four different um, campaigns or efforts. The zoning was very important. If you could, in a residential neighborhood, take down a block of six-story buildings and put up an 82-story building, and it's as of right, then something's cockeyed with the zoning. And so I, we hired, um, actually, uh, he's now our chairman of the board. You see how interesting and small world this is. Um, he is an attorney. And uh, we hired uh, Bob Davis and Chuck Warren, uh, who, were, who is now our board chair, uh, to look at the zoning and to see whether or not we could do something about this zoning. Also, it was one of the first times that you had a whole block where a developer could take down an entire block and amass the air rights from the whole block to put up this kind of a tower. And although this may not have been common, it certainly could have happened in other blocks as well. So we were looking to say this is something that isn't good, not just for here, but for any other. Then there was the issue of housing. Critically, critically impossible to get affordable housing. And to say to our government to take down these wonderful apartments, which were solidly built, that are providing people affordable housing For, now. Which we never could replace because it's too expensive to build again. To take away this housing is wrong. And we have to save, it was one of the largest uh, uh, bastion of affordable housing and it had to be saved. So we looked at the housing. We went to tenant groups, we went to government people who were interested in housing. And also the warehousing. Now, at a time that it was so critical, we couldn't, nobody could get affordable apartments. I had calls from artists and teachers and clerical workers to, to warehouse 600 apartments, which was happening here, should have been illegal. The uh, historic preservation, which we felt was the most important, uh, we felt was going to be our last uh, the last one that might come the last through. Component, yeah. No, not the, even the last component. We didn't. We thought that was the one that wasn't going to work, because, even though it was the most important. Because people came and looked at the complex, and said, "Well, you know, this isn't really very pretty. Uh, it's not like the Frick Museum." So I think one of the greatest accomplishments that the coalition made and the tenants was to help people to understand, broaden the concept of what is a landmark. Now, David Dinkins was very, very helpful as borough president. Mm -hmm. He understood the importance of affordable housing. But once he got to be mayor, he had other political uh, influences, and it was very hard to get to talk to him to see that this was, was calendared. So I get a call from a man named Bob Weaver. Now, Bob Weaver. I figured had to be 12 when he became the first black uh, cabinet member in the, in the Roosevelt administration, but he was very young. But he lived in the neighborhood, he read the story, it was written up in New York Magazine as the Battle of Yorkville, and he called and he said, 
I don't care what anybody says. I was there, and I know that these buildings were the model. The York Avenue estate was the model for all low-cost post-war housing, for all the public housing. And I said, would you go to Mr. Dinkins and tell him that? He did, and it got calendared. And the rest, as they say, is history.